performance medicine, and we're going to talk about men's health and what you need to know, why it's important for women to play a role in men's health, but more importantly, why it's important for men to take more initiative in their own health. Um, I am Anna Fadic. I am the Vice President of Men's Health Network. Um, we are an organization that's been around since 1992. Uh, we are based in Washington, D.C., um, but I'm also the chair of the Men's Health Caucus of the American Public Health Association. So I do a lot of work both um, in D.C. and across the country on public health programs. Dr. Rogers is going to introduce himself in just a minute, talk about his story. Um, so what we're covering today is what Men's Health Network is, um, the state of men's health, why men don't go to the doctor, um, prevention and screenings, taught men's concerns and how women can help. But what we want is this to be an interactive program. So if you have questions, I already have some questions here um, that people have submitted, but if you have any questions, please feel free. There are mics in the back um, or speak loudly and we're happy to answer anything that you might um, want to know about. So Men's Health Network's mission is to reach men and their families where they live, work, play, and pray. This is an example of our workplace, our Men at Work initiative, where we're going into workplaces like, like Walmart, John Deere, Harley Davidson, um, doing health fairs and educational programs, educating men and women about the importance of men's health. We're also on social media. You can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Um, we do programs with faith-based communities and also within the uh, professional sports organizations. We work with various NFL teams, NBA, MLB, trying to get guys where they're comfortable. Um, our biggest celebration months on the awareness period is June. For one, is Men's Health Month, so um, you may have heard about that. We uh, it started Men's Health Month back in 1994 at Men's Health Week, and President Bill Clinton had signed that into law. Uh, so every year, the week leading up to Father's Day is Men's Health Week. So we recognize that by getting governors and mayors of the different cities and states to submit proclamations announcing that week as the as awareness period. We encourage men for that month to go and get their screenings, to do different events, participate in health fairs, um, to get things going and give a gift of their life and their health to their families in recognition of Father's Day. The other month that we raise awareness for is September for prostate cancer awareness. And for men, that is the number one concern. Uh, we want to make sure that men are, are understanding their prostate health, going to the doctor, getting their screenings, both the digital rectal exam and the PSA blood test. Uh, Dr. Rogers will go into that um, a little bit later, but September is that time where we're raising awareness for that. And then Testicular Cancer Awareness Month is in April of each year. Testicular cancer affects boys and men between the ages of 15 to 35. So we're trying to get even younger boys to understand that what happens to them now, what they're doing now, is going to affect them later on down the line. Dr. Rogers? Anna, thank you so much for inviting me here today. Well, as Walmart, this is an incredible place. I've never seen a place like this. I'm very impressed. Um, let me tell you a little bit about, about today. <clears throat> I want to help men and women understand about health and what you can do to uh, keep healthy throughout your lifetime. Um, I was educated at the University of Tennessee. I'm kind of a typical family doctor in a way, and, um, although I changed about 10 years ago. Um, my previous practice, I would probably have five to seven minutes to spend with you. Uh, you would come in the room and I would look at your cholesterol and your cholesterol may be 240. I would think you need Lipitor. Um, I'll see you in three months. Let's do another blood test. Uh, by the way, your blood pressure's up. Let's put you on a blood pressure medicine and let's monitor that closely. Oh, and your, your diabetes test, even though the name one C is a little bit high, um, you may need some metformin. Let's, let's do that and um, see you back. <clears throat> in the meantime, two of my own children came down with type 1 diabetes at very early ages. Um, so I started thinking, you know, I really am a doctor and I don't know much about nutrition. And here I have all these type 2 diabetics, which are 95% of diabetics, and I really didn't know what to tell them other than to put them on a medication. So it really turned a light bulb on in my own life I started researching nutrition, health, preventive medicine. So I changed the whole way I practiced um, my medical, in my medical practice. Um, I went back and did a two-year fellowship in what we call integrated medicine, which is basically trying to find the root cause of the problem so we don't have to use all these medications. Um, we studied a lot about nutrition, a lot about hormones, a lot about preventive medicine and screening. So, I even wrote a book about it. If you're interested in a free download of my book, 
go to performancemedicine.net and you can download my book for free. I believe we brought a few here today too. But um, so that my whole focus and passion became instead of writing people prescription medicines like we're taught, is to try to guide them with what to eat, how to exercise, how to reduce stress, um, and at some point looking into the hormone balance. So by, in an off kind of way, I became a men's health expert. I've been practicing for 30 years now, and as a family doctor, you know, we're kind of the type of doctors that see you from birth to death. So I, I believe we really have the most experience in seeing what's going to happen to you. You know, and I'm a practicing doctor. I see patients every day. I'm not sitting in an ivory tower, you know, making numbers up and, and telling people what to do. I actually see it on a daily basis. So um, I think I have a lot of common sense. I've certainly done a lot of research and seen a lot of things through the years, and hopefully I can relate to you what's going to happen to you. So when you come into my office, my goal for you would be to sit and think, what am I going to look like and feel like 20 years from now? And that's become the whole focus of my, my whole uh, practice. Um, state of men's health, 10 top causes of, of death. Men die of nine of the top 10 causes of death, if you look at that slide. Heart disease, of course, is a big killer. Um, I've had friends that look just like me kill over with a heart attack in their 40s. Um, I've had friends develop prostate cancer, many, many patients, stroke, uh, chronic bronchitis, um, accidents. The only disease that I see in that top 10 that's more frequent than women is Alzheimer's disease. Um, and it's not only because women live longer, but there's some other factors as well. But my own mother and grandmother died of Alzheimer's disease. So I have a lot of experience, and we do a lot of research and genetic testing and trying to predict who will uh, be predisposed to have Alzheimer's disease. Medicine is, is changing. Let me put this in. Um, when I started practicing 31 years ago, it's totally different now made unbelievable advances in um, genetic testing, immunological therapy for cancers, and what we're doing is amazing, but when you look at it, the overall mortality rate's not that much greater. In our country, we're great if you have a specialized disease or you need a particular type of surgery, but for primary care and preventative medicine, we rank like 33 in the world. Some developing countries are better than us, and I, I know what's causing that. Uh, it's our lifestyles. So I preach a lot of lifestyle uh, things to you today. Hopefully you'll maybe jot down some mental notes as to what I'm going to say because you may not hear these any other place. And you may not hear from your family doctor because it's probably crashing like I used to. But look at Arkansas. Arkansas is kind of typical uh, for what kills people, heart disease and cancer. Um, it's a little worse than the average. I think where you live here in this demographic is a little better, um, but that's just an interesting slide there that we included. Why do men not go to the doctor? Um, women are 200% more likely to visit the doctor for preventive medicine. Um, Anna, why do you think women, you're a woman, why do women go to the doctor? You work with men's health. Why do not men go to the doctor? So. We all, as the kids growing up, we all went to the pediatrician, right? We're at the pediatrician until we're 18, and then we get put into our family practitioner, our um, internal medicine physician. Um, and then women, we get that special doctor. We get the OBGYN. So we're required to go to that doctor every year, every other year, to get our annual pap smear, um, to get cervical exams. But men aren't required to do that. Men, starting at the age of 15, have to start looking at testicular cancer. So they're, they're checking themselves in the shower. But there's no way that there, there's no doctor that's encouraging them to come in and say, let me do this test for you so we can test it out. Guys have to actually go to the doctor to check that out. So women are going to the doctor at least once a year for their annual exams. Women are the gatekeepers for health in the family. So when you have kids, it's usually the mom who's taking the kids to the doctor. So she has more of that experience. Um, so, you know, we don't really have that kind of force for men to go to the doctor pushing them to, to go. I know that for women, you'll get phone calls at 
free. If you, if you miss your mammogram, you get a phone call like every week reminding you, hey, come get your mammogram. So that's what we need to get for guys is to have that, that push from the doctor's office. I think if you look at the next slide, men are really they're scared to go to the doctor. Um, one thing I always tell my patients is that ignorance is not bliss. Um, so you don't want to just ignore it or you're going to have problems. If you look at it early, I'm a big believer in screening tests. Uh, there's a big bill that's going to be considered today uh, in Congress about the U.S. Preventive Task Force. And they've come out and said that, well, we may not need PSAs in some of these tests, but I'm telling you, 30 years of experience has saved many, many lives as well as mammograms. So we're certainly supportive of that effort to uh, have a more integrative approach to who makes these decisions on who gets tested. So I certainly think they're very helpful. If you can diagnose cancer early, you're certainly way ahead of the game. I've seen many lives saved by that. But why do men not go to the doctor? Do we think it's a macho thing? It's a cry baby to go to the doctor. Um, Big boys don't cry, it's an interesting slide. I don't have time, I don't like doctors. Um, I don't need to go until I'm older. Um, I'm afraid if I find something wrong with me, the doctor will tell me and I won't like it, I'll deny treatment, so. Do you guys recognize any of these? Have you given any of these responses to why you don't go to the doctor or have you heard them? Yeah, I see some men sticking over here. Um, you know, we hear these all the time and we have to change this idea that that health and going to the doctor is some kind of is, is emasculating. It's not because if you're healthy, you're able to help your your loved ones. Or you're able to be there for the family because men see themselves as the provider, um, and so they want to be there for their family, take care of their families. Well, if you're not going to the doctor, then these things don't really matter. You're not going to be there for your family. That's a very very important point. What about women's health? I want to talk about women too. Really, women die the same thing that men die. They just do it later. Um, women are kind of protected before menopause from heart disease to a certain extent, but actually when women, when you have a heart attack as a woman, you're more likely to die. That's, that's something a lot of people think. Women are more susceptible to autoimmune disease. I see a lot of women with problems with lupus, thyroid, rheumatoid arthritis, a lot more of the chronic diseases. Uh, so as a man, you're more likely to kill over and die. As a woman, you're more likely to suffer and, and hurt a lot. Uh, but women, um, are much more likely to come in and at least take note of it. So, but women are also the, the caretakers of the family. Um, women are much more responsible than men. Would everybody agree with that? I mean, women, you know, they, they just are. They're, they're better people. <laughs> they really are. There's a great story I have about um, a situation where there was a car accident and there was brain damage to this, this, this family's loved one. So they went and they were in the emergency room and the neurosurgeon comes out and the patient is basically brain dead. So um, there's a new thing where they can get a brain transplant. So they're gonna try it on this patient. The neurosurgeon comes out and says, you know, this is a very expensive operation. It's not covered by insurance. Um, we have two choices. You can get a male brain for $100,000. You can, there's a female brain you can get for $20,000. Everybody's shocked. Why does the male brain cost so much than the female brain? The neurosurgeon goes, because the female brain's been used. Uh, Get it? Uh, oh. So we've also seen that um, at conception, 115 boys for every 105 girls are conceived. At birth, 105 boys are born to every 100 girls. Then the, the the numbers even out until about the age of 34. At 34, we start seeing an increase in, um, in the numbers of women over men. Um, when you hit retirement age, for every 85, um, for every 100 women, there are 85 men. So men are dying a lot sooner, as we had said. But if you guys are one of the lucky few and you make it to 100, men are more likely to be better off health-wise, mentally, physically, than women who are also 100. So guys, you start off strong in the womb, and then you can end strong, but we have to get you to be 100 years old, so then you can tell women, hey, you know, we're, we're healthier, we're, we're doing better than you. So let's get you to 100. And people are really more scared of having Alzheimer's disease than cancer. It's, it's a very horrible disease. Um, but anyway, um, prevention, let's talk about prevention, because to me, that's the key. Um, start early. 
you know, don't wait until you're 50 years old to have your first health exam. Start in your 20s. Uh, you need less in your 20s than when you do at 50, but um, and involve your family. Be a role model for your kids. Um, so think about going to the doctor early. Um, the main things that I look at with health, and if you'll read my book that I focus on, are really four things. Nutrition, which I knew nothing about when I was a general practice doctor. Exercise, and we'll talk, we'll go into a little bit of detail on that. Um, stress and sleep, and then hormone balance. So we'll talk about a few of those, but get your family involved in, in your health. Um, let's see the next slide. So if anybody has any questions, feel free. Um, I'm gonna actually give one question. There was one that leads into the next topic. So as a young man in my 20s, what should I be thinking about that I'm not? Okay, that's a great question. These questions came from you, so I thought it'd be good. If you wanna raise your hand and ask another question, you certainly can. Uh, this is a very relaxed atmosphere. So in your 20s, what can you do that you're not really thinking about? Well, one is testicular cancer. You need to do a self-check for testicular cancer. That's a young man's cancer. We rarely see it past 30, 35. We usually see it in the early 20s. And back when I first was a medical resident 34 years ago, I can never forget riding up the elevator at the hospital with a young man who we had just diagnosed with testicular cancer, knowing that he was dead. This was a dead man. Now, if you detect it early, there's a, like a 98% cure rate. So early detection and self-exams are very, very important. Um, of course, you need to start looking at your blood pressure. You need to get your cholesterol checked. Um, although that's not the whole story. Cholesterol is a very misleading thing. So before you get slapped on a staff medication, um, you need to uh, get a get some further testing, and I'll tell you about a thing called the Boss Smart yeah. Panel that I order on almost every one of my patients. Um, you need to be screened for cancer of thyroid, lymph node, mouth, skin. Uh, for females, of course, it's a Pap smear test. If you get too normal, then every three years is probably adequate. Um, in your 20s and 30s, about the same thing. I start doing a complete exam on everybody in their 40s. Uh, and remember, when you go to the doctor, this is an important point, you visit your family doctor. If you go in there for, say, like a sinus infection, and then you go, oh, by the way, I'm dizzy, I have headaches, I'm constipated, my little toe is numb, um, that doctor is probably going to blow you off because of time constraints and uh, coding and everything. Uh, medicine's evolved into a, into a big business, really. And you need to get a family doc or primary care that will actually listen to you. But once a year, go in there, write down the list of things that you're concerned about the most, and have him or her address those issues while they're doing your, your physical. Uh, but there's in your 40s. I really recommend, there's a couple things. Of course, heart disease is a major killer of men and women. But a couple of great tests that I'll look at uh, to get a great picture of somebody's risk for heart disease. One is called the Boston Heart Panel. And it not only checks your cholesterol, but how big those particles are. Not just your LDL, HDL, but actually the size and number of particles of the LDL, how big your HDL particles are, how sticky they are, um, how inflamed your body is, how inflamed your arteries are. It gives me vitamin levels, it gives me some genetic testing, uh, it gives me an insulin number to see if you're insulin resistant and may be at risk for diabetes. Um, it gives me a fatty acid analysis of PSA. It checks all your hormones. Um, this is an amazing test called the Boston Heart Panel. I called the folks in Boston. I run thousands of these, and it's available here in Bentonville and several local doctors. So ask about the Boston Heart Panel. And when you get 40 years old, get something called at 40 for a man, 50 for a woman, get a CAT scan, it's like a $50 test of your heart. It's called a coronary calcium scoring. Very important test to get to see if you've got some early uh, calcifications in your coronary arteries. Very good predictor of heart disease. So I have those two tests. Um, that's basically what I need. The other thing I look at is when a patient walks into my room is 
waist to hip ratio. I work with a lot of obesity and I work with a lot of people with low T. That's probably 70% of my practice is trying to get weight off people, off medications they don't need and um, get them leaner and then evaluate their hormone status. Um, in a man, you should have a waist to hip ratio of one. In other words, you're, if you measure yourself around your belly button, it should be the same width as the widest part of your hips. In a woman, it should be 80%, 0.8, because a woman's hips are wider. So look at that waist to hip ratio. To me, that's more important than a BMI. BMI is a very misleading um, measurement, in my opinion. That's the measure that most people use. You can get a 250 pound muscular linebacker that has a BMI in the morbidly obese range, yet he has no body fat on him. So look at the waist to hip ratio. Um, you can get these tests, the Boston Heart Panel and the Coronary Calcium Score, they're available everywhere. We'll take them to your doctor. Your doctor may not know about these tests. Did the Boston test for women also? There's a microphone. The, the question is, is the Boston test for women also? Yes, Boston tests are for men and women equally. They'll show male hormones and female hormones. Very important. Tell you where you are in, in relation to menopause. Um, Female hormones are more complicated than men. Um, I'm known in Tennessee as the male hormone doctor expert. And, but I actually see as many females as males because they come to doctor. They're a little more complex hormonally just because of the fluctuations of hormones. And women basically need four hormones. Men need one. Uh, women, men need testosterone. Women need safe forms of estrogen, progesterone, testosterone as well as men. Women need testosterone, remember that. They also need DHEA. And I'm not even talking about other, other hormones like thyroid and insulin and cortisol, some of those others that we, that we dig into. But hormones control everything. And uh, so don't ignore your hormones. Um, what about another question? We had, we had these questions submitted. We covered the main buses. And at age 50, please get a colonoscopy. Uh, that is probably the most life-saving test that you'll ever have is a colonoscopy. It's a piece of cake. You know, I was all worried about mine. My brother's a colon surgeon. He did my colonoscopy. I didn't know it happened. So please do not be scared of either a rectal exam to check your prostate. It takes about five seconds. And don't be afraid of a colonoscopy. My, in my previous practice, my 57-year-old nurse died of a horrible death of colon cancer. She never got a colonoscopy. She also smoked, unfortunately. But uh, please get that colonoscopy. That is a life-saving procedure. And not only at 50, if you have symptoms of changes in bowel habits or receding blood or you have a family history of colon cancer, you're going to have to get that test much earlier. So it's a life-saving test over any test as a colonoscopy. Okay. So another question is, have there been any advancements with early heart disease beyond cholesterol screening? Well, certainly there has been the two I just talked about, the Boston Heart Panel and the Coronary Calcium Support. There's a lot of things we can do. I think a lot of times as doctors, we're very quick to write prescriptions and based on just a total cholesterol number. A lot of times, if that patient has a cholesterol of 240, and yet they don't smoke, their blood pressure is good, they have no family history, they have a good calcium scoring, and I look at the outlay of their other laboratory, I certainly won't put them on a statin medication. I know statins can save lives, but I've also seen statins kill people, cause a lot of misery. And if you happen to be on a statin, complete statin is S T A T I N, like Lipitor or Zofor, Pravacol, um, you need to take a vitamin called CoQ10. That's an absolute mandatory vitamin that you can take over the counter if you have to take a statin. But in my opinion, we kind of overuse statins and underutilize vitamins. Um, you know, whenever I get a patient that comes to me and they're on a list of medicines that long, I immediately try to get them down on the medication list. Um, it benefits everybody. All right, so now we're gonna get into a question that someone asked um, related to office work, and it's what are the health risks related to an office job versus manual labor? So for example, life expectancy or health outcomes. Um, there's certainly no doubt in my mind that physical labor is more healthy than, than office work. Um, 
Um, that's one thing that Dan wanted us to address today, and we're certainly going to. We're going to, going to have a demonstration of uh, some of this, but we may test some of you people. But um, I certainly think that um, manual labor is much more healthy than sitting in front of a computer all day. It's very unhealthy. There are certain things that we're going to address that, that you can do. There's a new saying that sitting is the new smoking. Um, definitely smoking is, a, is the worst thing possible you can do for your health. I mean, there's, you know, I have people all the time that come into my office and they're um, really picky about all these little vitamins they're taking and their hormone balances and all this. And you know, I look up and they're smoking two packs of cigarettes a day and, I, and I'll actually tell them, I don't know why you're worried about these minor things because you're killing yourself with the cigarettes. Nothing else matters. So if you're a smoker, please make every effort in the world to quit smoking. It will kill you eventually. It will, it will make your life miserable. Um, and not just from lung cancer and heart disease, but many, many other cancers are caused by smoking and debilitations. But, um, so how many of you guys work at a desk all day? Okay, so virtually everybody, as I, as I came in the building, I was super amazed at, at these workplaces, just an amazing place to be. Um, but I noticed everybody's on, on their computers kind of hunched over, and that's a very unhealthy thing, not just for your neck and your back, but actually it causes cancer, it causes heart disease, it causes anxiety, it causes depression. Um, a couple examples of uh, one guy on the left is that's posture you probably shouldn't do in the workplace or home. Uh, the one on the right's a lot better. Now look at the way that guy's sitting. Very straight, has the right kind of uh, eye level at the top of his computer screen. Um, his back is always extended rather than hunched over. Um, and it really, I know you guys offer the, the uh, standing desk here, and to me that's kind of the answer. Um, I don't necessarily think you need a treadmill desk, but there's no doubt that a standing desk is an amazing thing in the workplace. I work with a lot of companies back in Tennessee, and it's, it's really changed people's lives. And when you're at a standing desk, don't stand like this at the desk. Take a posture like this, and then change it like this. It gives you a wider stance and much better on your back. If you have to sit at a desk, do the correct posture, Every 15 to 30 minutes, you need to get up from that desk. And even if it's just kind of stretching, you know, like this, like that, extending your back, bending your hamstrings, you know, on a neck roll. That, do that every 15 to 20 minutes and walk around a little bit. But if you have a standing desk, it's much, much better. How many people have a standing desk? And so a lot of you, it's unbelievable. Walmart's way ahead of all these other companies on that. Um, very, very important. Um, you should work, you should walk at least 10,000 steps a day. Um, I want to hit nutrition here for a second because there's a lot of myths about nutrition. And I found this out through working with my own diabetic children. I had no idea about what people should eat. And I was taught that we should eat a low fat diet. And Back in the early 80s, because of Congress and a lot of political food industry type things, we put everybody on a low-fat diet. What happened in the last 30 or 40 years? Our obesity rates have just skyrocketed. Um, everybody's overweight. That's the major, I think that's our major health problem in the United States is really obesity. Um, it's killing people. You don't see any old fat people. They're dead. Um, they, they suffer from all these medications. And I see these commercials of, you know, people that go into the doctor and they get their Lipitor and they, they say, my number's great, and they go skipping out of on, on TV and yet they weigh 50 pounds over what they should weigh. Um, some of these commercials just kill me. And we're, we're really doing the wrong thing by, I think, directing consumer ads by some of these pharmaceutical companies. Um, you know, the answer is not getting on another medication. The answer is learning how to eat, exercise, stay lean, get a good night's sleep, and keep stress down. It's not you need another pill. The, the one commercial that kills me the most is, it's on all the time, is 
a commercial that would come on that says, do you have small cell lung cancer? You know, you, there, there's a new uh, chemo drug for this. You tell your doctor about it. How many people that are sitting there watching TV are going to go, yeah, that's me, I have small cell lung cancer. I think I'll go to my doctor and, and tell him about this new drug. If, you're on, if you have lung cancer and your oncologist doesn't know about this drug, you're in bad shape. So I think, I, I really think that some of the pharmaceutical companies are even making up diseases to sell a drug, I really do. I'm pro-pharmaceutical companies but because they do some amazing things, but I think they're a little overdoing it with pushing it on people. Because people come to me as a family doc and, you know, they want that pill for the, you know, the new fibromyalgia pill, yet they're not moving. We don't even know if it's a real disease. Um, what about fitness? Are there any questions on fitness? So we do have a question about, um, so we have a question about nutrition. Why can't we live forever on a diet of barbecue ribs, wings, and chocolate cake? Why can't we live on barbecue ribs, chocolate cake? Um, well, I think that's an obvious answer. It's just a terrible thing for you. Really, um, I love working out. I do it every day, not for two hours. I do it for about 30 minutes, and I'll tell you about that. But um, you can't out-train a bad diet. And our diet has too much sugar in it. The big myth is that we need low fat. Really, we need lower carb. Most people eat way too much sugar, way too much bread, potatoes, pasta, corn, rice, cereal. Cereal is not a healthy breakfast. Um, bacon and eggs is a lot more healthy than breakfast. I find that most of my patients really do better with kind of a paleo type diet, um, not a low carb diet. It's really a combination, you'll see it in my book if you download it. It's more of a combination of a Mediterranean and paleo type diet, eating real food. Um, I know Walmart is promoting vegetables in, in all their, their uh, stores, their grocery stores, and I'm impressed with Walmart because they have stevia. They, you know, they use a lot of natural uh, sugar substitutes instead of some of the old ones that we used to think were good for you that actually aren't. So, I mean, that's an obvious question. That's a terrible diet. You can't, what you eat is the first step in, in how you're going to age. And if your gut's not working, then you're not going to be healthy. If you are if you have a lot of stomach upset and you're constipated or you get a lot of heartburn, you don't need a lot of medicine for that. You need to figure out what you're eating is causing that problem. I mean, we're pushing next in the Prilosec on everybody because it works, it does help heartburn. But really, God put acid in your stomach for two reasons to digest your food and absorb your minerals. So if you're taking something like Nexium or Prilosec every day, then you're not producing any acid and you won't digest your food and you won't be as healthy. Your chances of getting osteoporosis are about a hundred times greater if you take those type of daily medicine. So try to figure out you know, what you're eating and what's causing that stomach imbalance. And we'll get into a little bit of the vitamins in a minute because I think you need to take. But, um, what about uh, oats? That's going to be later. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Here, we're talking about the sitting, the standing desk. One good thing that Dan pointed out to me was something he had run across on the internet and actually tried. When a patient walks into my office, two things I really try to assess their health is by that waist to hip ratio and the sit to stand test. Has anybody ever heard of the sit, sit to stand test? Um, I may get some of you guys to come up. Dan, do you want to demonstrate that? Sure. Get it, Dan. Um, this is a great test. And I'll tell you a story about um, as you get older, how you're able to get up from the floor to a standing position is something I really look at. My own dad, who was a surgeon, later in his life, I noticed he was falling some, and falls kill people. And said, Hell, that's what kills people, is falls. So he'd work on balance. But I asked my dad to get in the floor and just get up by any means necessary. He and me were both amazed that he could not get out of the floor at all. Four months he was passed away because of a fall that killed him. Um, but anyway, and what what I do, I ask people just to cross their legs, and you can both do this, okay? I'm not gonna do it. I can do this, but I'm not gonna do it right now. But cross your legs and go to a sitting position without using your arms. Just sit down. 
Excellent, you get five points just for that. That's perfect. All right, now I want you to get back up without using your arms. That's amazing. That is amazing. Does anybody else want to try that? Anybody want to come up and try it? Any brave soul want to get up here? Cross, cross your legs. Sit down. Perfect. All right, you lost half a point for that sway back. Okay, now stand back up without using your hands. You can use some momentum. <laughs> That's hard. I'll tell you, that is hard. Oh. <laughs> that's amazing. So, in other words, that's hard. To, that is very hard to do, isn't it? I mean, he's got tight, tight hamstrings. And maybe if you have knee or hip problems, it's going to be hard to do. So, work on that. My favorite exercise is really yoga. You know, you're right. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> Um, so, I don't think that you need to work out for two hours a day. Um, I think that you need to work out intensely, for maybe 20 to 30 minutes. That's all I work out. And I do something that I enjoy, and it certainly includes a little weight training and yoga. Those are two things that I like to do a little interval training, a little bicycle to uh, keep me in shape. What do you like to do? Oh, um, well, I do bar. So that's my workout of choice, mix of aerobics, yoga. I like that. Um, when I go to the gym too. Awesome, awesome. Um, I have a question about uh, what vitamins are essential after the age of 50. Okay. 15 years ago, I would tell all my patients that came into me, I'd call them bioholics, they were wasting their money. They were just urinating their vitamins out. 15 years later, I, I'll tell you, I couldn't have been more wrong. You need to eat great, but there's no way that you're going to get the vitamins you need to do what you're eating. You need some supplements. And probably the most important one that um, I would tell people to take is vitamin D. I think the most people agree with that, but most people get their vitamin D levels checked. It's on the Boston Heart Panel. Vitamin D level, if your doctor's not doing that test, you need to get a vitamin D level checked. It prevents cancer helps your mood. It's a sunshine diet. Nobody gets enough of it. Um, it prevents diabetes. Of course, it prevents osteoporosis, many of the bone. So, by far, number one, vitamin D is actually a hormone, not even a vitamin. Uh, so, have that checked. Um, a good multivitamin with all the minerals. Everybody, every human needs a probiotic. What that is is good bacteria. Um, that's a no-brainer. Vitamin C, Linus Pauling was right. You do need vitamin C gram a day, omega-3, which is fish or krill oil, get a good, solid, uh, natural krill oil uh, that you've got to sell. Um, and there's a lot of other vitamins that you take. I'm 61 year almost 62 years old. I take about 30 vitamins a day. And uh, magnesium is another one that you take at night. Magnesium is a very important mineral. You take it at night because it relaxes you, helps you sleep. Vince cardiac arrhythmias and helps bowel movements. So magnesium is about go to my book and look at the, the uh, particulars on that. Um, usual suspects. Is there a question on that? So other than these, um, you know, testosterone for men is, is a big question and, and we see a lot of these low T clinics popping up that are um, providing these injections for men. What can you tell us about that? Okay, low T. It's very popular, it's on commercials now. It is bringing up awareness about low testosterone, and I treat thousands and thousands of guys with low T. Probably the one medication that I will tell you that makes the biggest difference in men or women is testosterone. Now, you have to know what you're doing with testosterone. Uh, it's very, very good for you. Testosterone does not cause heart disease. It does not cause prostate cancer contrary to certain myths. Now, when you get it, you have to know what you're doing. You have to follow certain things. So, in one way, a lot of tea clinics that are popping up are kind of a good thing, but another thing, bad in a way, because a lot of them don't really follow what you need to look at. 
And with certain guys like younger guys, if I have a young guy with low T, I have to find out what causes that low T in this case. Um, because if, if you just start popping with testosterone, you're going to decrease their fertility rate and you're going to shut down their own production of their own testosterone. So you're doing a disservice. So there's a lot of little ways I can get around that with uh, precursors and uh, a lot of things. But it's very prevalent. I've seen a lot of guys in their late 20s and 30s come in with testosterone levels of you know, 200. A normal testosterone level is 350 to 900. And remember, with normal, you're looking at everything on a bell curve, so it's a skewed curve anyway. You want to be at about six or 700, not 350. And you look at the symptoms, like, and we have, we have some great handouts with low TO there. You can actually complete our questionnaire um, on the external what you may have low T. Um, but symptoms are usually a guy that comes in, he's tired. He has low libido. He may or may not have erectile dysfunction. He's not sleeping well. He has lost strength and endurance on workouts. He can't build muscle. Um, he is, is depressed. Whenever I see a young guy come in that's depressed in their 30s, uh, of course I look at the stress in their lives, but I also look at their testosterone levels. If it's low, they need testosterone. They don't need Prozac. I've seen a lot of guys that came in with me on antidepressants that really are not depressed. They're, they just have low T. So um, get your doctor starting at least at 30 to get a baseline testosterone level on you. And also, an estrogen level. Um, estrogen level, it's good for women, bad for men. You need some of it, but not a lot of it. A lot of times, I'll see guys that come in that are very overweight. What happens is they aromatize their testosterone to estradiol. And I actually see guys that have a higher estrogen level than their wife. It's very bad for them. It causes heart disease. It causes enlargement of the prostate also. I deal a lot with a lot of enlarged prostates as well. So you need to get a baseline PSA, a CBC, a metabolic panel, and a free and total testosterone. Um, and if you're a young guy, also check some things like a blue and a lactic level. Go to a doctor who knows what he's doing with testosterone. If you read my book, I talk a lot about it. Methods of replacement, you have the daily creams, you have weekly shots, and I use a lot of pellet there. You have the pellets the skin that dissolves over about six months so you don't have to do anything. You gotta be careful with the creams because if they get on your partner or your kids, it's really bad for them when they start growing a mustache and everything. So you gotta be really careful with the creams. Um, pellets are my favorite way to do it. But um, very, very common, low tea. Think about it, get your doctor to check. It's on the Boston Heart Panel. All right, so there's a question about, are there any studies that currently show a health benefit to staying in the workplace that all I think it's very important. We need to talk about mental health a little bit because depression and anxiety are just random. And here we're hitting them with a lot of medications that really have a lot of side effects that they can get hooked on as well. Um, so you want to really find out what the underlying problem is. Um, but yes, I certainly think that the longer you work and are interested in things, the longer you're going to live. I see it all the time in, in people in my little town of uh, Tennessee, a small town. We have a big company called East McKinley Company. And I noticed that when the guys retire, they die. A lot of them many years. So I think that keeping an active mind and engaged and working as long as you can certainly kind of wards off dementia. It also helps depression. You need to be passionate about things. And do retire, I hope you have a hop or something that you can do that actually gives the community. Um, a lot of these people that come in to me and are depressed and anxious, I tell them, you know, what are you doing for somebody else? A lot of times if they'll start volunteering, they'll take their mind off themselves and actually come out of depression. I think certain medications we have them are great, they work and they need it, but um, but men are men are kind of very under diagnosed with depression. We have 20 vets committing suicide every day, and that, that's a real problem, very concerning. Um, 
Uh, I've known friends that have committed suicide. There was a family doc in my hometown two weeks ago that 20 patients blew his brains out. So that's very, very concerning. Men are not coming and telling the problems to the doctor, to their spouses, and acting too much. And so that's very, very concerning is, is, uh, is suicide. And uh, depression is a big time killer for the workplace. And, and your guys' jobs, you're, you're interested in productivity. And you know, you're, you're probably type A and workaholics. I see a lot of workaholics becoming depressed and anxious and not sleeping and worried. Um, so be open about it. There's a lot of things you can do to, to overcome that. One thing is checking their low teeth. Uh, I think because men don't typically talk about their problems. They think that it's, um, like I said, it's emasculating themselves if they're talking about what's wrong with them because they want to be that fighter. Um, a lot of times, women are the ones talking about it, so men take to other options. So they'll take a smoking, they'll take a drinking, other kind of reckless behavior that may hurt them in the long run. Um, accidents are huge for the, the male population because they're doing things and not keeping themselves safe. So that's something else. You know, if, we, if we move towards talking to a trusted friend or partner or even a physician, you're, you're lessening the, the risk of alcoholism or even tobacco or other drugs. Yeah. <laughs> stress, chronic stress causes depression, no doubt about it. Uh, acute stress is even more, stress kills. Really the two, the two, when I did a fellowship in integrated medicine, which is finding out the root cause of the problem of disease, two things always pop up, food and stress. To me those are the biggest killers foods and stress because it call, they both cause inflammation. Inflammation causes disease. That's one reason I like this false heart panel. It measures your level of inflammation. And that's very, very important. So if you are getting headaches, stomach aches, if you're having breathing problems, if you can't sleep, if you notice that you're irritable, and, you know, seek help. And if you see your friend or colleague or family member that's having these symptoms, Please ask them about it. You know, this is really men, especially if they know that somebody cares, you're more likely to kind of open up about it and seek treatment because it's very, very important. Um, so uh, we're going to open this up to questions. Uh, we do have a booth over here with some great people and great handouts. And if you have some personal questions, I'm going to be here all afternoon, so I'll certainly take you aside and answer questions. You can get a copy of my book. Um, but the folks at Men's Health Network um, are unbelievably great. You know, they do amazing things. And we need women to help men. We really do. We need it more than anything is for the women to step up and help us men because we're probably not going to do it. Well, the women are there and they're, we're doing it, but we need the, you know, the guys to step up and do this. Because women, we can't forget about ourselves, right? We're so busy caring about our family. We're getting to kiss the doctor, trying to get him to go to the doctor. But sometimes we forget about ourselves. We need that mental health time to ourselves. We need to be able to relieve our stress and enjoy, whether it's a glass of wine at night or going to the spa with the girls. Um, you know, women need to, to also pay attention to, to that. But there are activities that you can do with your partner. So you can go for walks after dinner, cook healthy meals together so we're not eating the barbecue ribs and wings. Um, you're eating more fruits and vegetables, and then you're kind of working it hand in hand. And does anybody have any questions? Yeah, it should be working. Can you talk to the uh, family history? What kind of questions we should be asking uh, for health, is, uh, health issues for the parents, the grandparents, how far back should we go? Any insights on that? As far as family history, yeah. uh, what you should be at, telling your doctor, or what we should be asking you, is that what you mean? Well, what should we be asking our own family, and what should we bring to the doctors? That's a great question because family history is very important to watch your predispositions on it. Now, lifestyle, I think, covers about 80% of what's going to happen to you. But think, ask questions like um, Is there colon cancer in the family? Is there heart disease? And are there forms of dementia that run in your family? High blood pressure, diabetes, um, kidney problems. Um, the major illnesses, especially blood, start looking at your blood pressure very early. Uh, 
those are the typical things we look at. So on both sides of the family, genetic testing is available. We do a lot of genetic testing, so you know, we can actually look at your DNA. I mean, they map the whole human genome. So and a lot of it's available. It's getting cheaper to look at, actually, if you can't tell us that your mom had uh, diabetes, um, looking at your actual genome, we can actually kind of guide you that way. There's a great test that I use, it's a salivary swab that will tell me what medicines that you should definitely avoid um, and what genetic tendencies like the APOE gene for Alzheimer's. I look at a lot of those. It's Boston Heart Family is a lot of them. It's important when you're, you know, to get that, like you said, ask your family, so you ask your dad, your mom, your grandparents, but some of the older generations didn't go to the doctors often, and that's why it's important for you at this age to start so that your kids and your grandparents or your grandkids have that history for you. Um, you know, think back and, and think when grandma and grandpa were alive, what were, what were their ailments? Were they having problems getting up? Were they suffering from arthritis? Because that might mean that it could be in the family, you may get that. Some things to just you know keep in mind, but if you if you don't have that, if your family can't provide that for you, then you know you start up yourself and just kind of keep an eye on them. My question in regards to uh, testosterone, uh, 37, getting ready to move into the 40s. And so, is there any is one is testosterone regenerative? And second, if so, I hope it is. That if there's activities I can do we can do to keep that level up or slightly increase in the future? It's a great, great question. Um, yes, there are things you can do to raise your testosterone naturally. Um, of course, this is weird, but you know how when an athlete wins a race, they automatically go you know, like that. You know, they raise their hands. Or a football player makes a big play, and, you know, they do it like that. That actually raises, they measure salivary testosterone levels. And after somebody does that, you can just put your hands up, stand and talk, your testosterone level goes up about 20%. Just by your posture. And posture is another thing you need to look at for health is posture. Uh, but yeah, you need to start looking at your testosterone levels early. And sometimes it does run in families, low T does. I think because of um, the world that we live in, we live in a more of a toxic world than we did 50 years ago. All kinds of pesticides, pollutants, um, stress, uh, that will lower your testosterone level dramatically. Lifting weights will raise your testosterone level. Exercise is the best way to do it. Eating right, I mean, if you're eating a lot of soy products, I don't like soy products because they're too estrogenic. Um, a lot of artificial preservatives will lower your testosterone because they have an estrogenic effect. I mean, why are these young girls at eight, eight years old starting puberty? It's because of the food they're eating, all the hormones and contaminants of food. So we're seeing low T at an early age. So yeah, you can raise your own testosterone by exercise, getting a great night's sleep, not developing diabetes, not getting obese, Almost every obese person I see or diabetic has low T. I don't even have to measure it, I do, but they all have low T, chronic diseases. Another thing is take zinc, 50 milligrams of zinc. Every male that's over 30 should take 50 milligrams of zinc because it raises your testosterone level and prevents conversion to estradiol. So those are the things, staying active, get a good night's sleep. I mean, sleep apnea, sleep apnea is a big thing. If you're, you or your partner snoring and you wake up and you're tired, check a sleep test. You can do a home sleep study that will detect sleep apnea. You know, some of the new devices we have for sleep apnea are really life saving. Sleep apnea is a killer. It will kill you. It will cause hypertension and diabetes and cancer. But yeah, get your T level checked for sure. And if you're having all the symptoms of just a low T and your levels say 500, which is kind of Immediate, get a free testosterone test. Insist that your doctor get a free testosterone. And that should be measured in the morning. It doesn't have to be fasting, but measured in the morning. Great question. Any other questions? There is one that I had here uh, before we finish um, about aspirin. People 
doctors have been telling um, folks to take an aspirin a day for blood thinning to prevent stroke and heart attack. What do you recommend for, for that? That's a great question. I really do recommend a, an 81 milligram baby aspirin. For all men at age 40, women at 50, um, unless you have an ulcer or you can't tolerate the aspirin, then you shouldn't take it. But um, because it does thin your blood a little bit, and if you have an ulcer, you bleed more. But there's definitely a lot of great benefits by just taking the baby aspirin. It prevents colon cancer. It makes your blood a little less likely to clot. So and a lot of times I'll do a test for aspirin to see if you. Uh, it will benefit you, but I, I think for most people at a certain age, it's a very beneficial thing. Great. Well, thank you guys so much for, for listening and paying attention. Um, we do have our contact information here if you'd like more information. Um, please do follow Men's Health Network on Facebook and Twitter. We put a lot of information out there. We do a lot of Twitter chats. And visit us at the table. Um, as Dr. Rogers has said, we have a lot of information on general men's health for um, uh, topics, we have stuff on what women need to know about men's health, and then Dr. Rogers will be there to answer any questions that you may not have thought about at this time, but we'll be here until the end of the event, and we're doing a grip strength assessment as well to test how strong you are, so bring your co-workers, see who's the strongest, um, and then we have some blue ribbons uh, for men's health awareness as well. Thank you so much.